Okay, we're now going to talk about the peritoneum and answer the what questions. What is peritoneum and its parts, peritoneal fluid and mesothelium? What is the difference between intra and retroperitoneal organs and what provides innervation and vascular supply to the peritoneum? Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Morton and I'm the noted anatomist. So here we have in this schematic a picture of the trunk and the orange line represents the diaphragm and above the diaphragm are three um, serous sacs. We have the pericardial sac containing the heart and then flanking either side of the pericardial sac are two pleural sacs both containing the lungs and below the diaphragm is the peritoneal sac engulfing abdominal pelvic organs and that's what we're going to talk about. And so the abdominal pelvic cavity is lined with a serous membrane called the peritoneum and the peritoneum completely or partially lines the internal surface of the abdominal wall and organs of the abdominal cavity. So let's do some uh, discussion of some of this jargon. So first of all, what is a serous membrane? Well, serous membrane lines the wall and organs of a body cavity and makes serous fluid. So this picture shown here is a cross section through the abdominal cavity. So that's the uh, serous membrane we're going to talk about. And so in pink, there's the serous membrane lining the abdominal cavity and it makes fluid. And because this is the abdominal cavity, it's going to be peritoneal fluid, which then goes within the peritoneal cavity, the space or cavity within the serous membrane, and fills it. Um, so what's mesothelium? Well, if we now take a little section like this, like that, and blow it up, that's mesothelium. It's the tissue that comprises the serous membrane um, and makes the peritoneal fluid that goes in the peritoneal cavity. So what is peritoneum? Well, Greek for peritoneum means stretched around. And so a peritoneum is the serous membrane that stretches around or lines the abdominal cavity and it's made of mesothelial tissue. So there in blue, we just outlined or the lining of this um, serous membrane that stretches and wraps around the inside of the abdominal cavity and organs. Well, the peritoneum is like a fist in a balloon. So there's a balloon and inside the balloon is air and outside the balloon or lining the balloon is plastic. And there's a fist. Now watch, shing, shing, shing. I'm gonna ask a question. Is the fist in the balloon? And the answer is no. What the what? Because what happens now is we see that inside the balloon is air. But look, if we trace along the outside of the balloon and see the fist going inside, the fist is not in the air. The fist simply pushed in the side of the balloon and is covered in plastic. Okay, So the peritoneum is like a fist in a balloon where there's a balloon and there's the peritoneal cavity. There's a fist and there's the GI tract. And so if we then do this, shing, 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 notice that the following, is the GI tract in the peritoneal cavity? The answer is no. Why? Well, there's our mesothelial tissue lining the outside and the mesothelial tissue, you'll notice, and then notice the peritoneal fluid. The GI tract is not in the fluid. The GI tract simply pushed in the side of the peritoneum and is covered in mesothelium, much like a fist in the side of a balloon. So what is peritoneum? Well, there's our peritoneal cavity filled with peritoneal fluid and the parietal peritoneum forms the wall and the mesentery, this double membrane, and the visceral peritoneum that lines the uh, organs. And all the parietal peritoneum, mesentery, and visceral peritoneum are all continuous with each other. So what's the difference between peritoneum and mesothelium? Well, distinguishing peritoneum from mesothelium is like clothing. And since there is a, a you can classify a t-shirt in two ways, you can say, hey, what's that made of? Oh, it's made of cotton. And what is the name of that cotton? Well, we call it a t-shirt. Well, the same way you can classify the peritoneum in two ways, one by material and say, oh, that's made of mesothelium or by this name, which is peritoneum. Okay, so now let's talk about this peritoneal sac that has the following three components, parietal peritoneum, mesentery, and visceral peritoneum. So the parietal peritoneum and the word parietal means wall. It's the part of the peritoneal sac that lines the wall and uh, it's in contact with the abdominal, abdominal pelvic wall there in blue.
and it's going to be innervated by somatic. We're now going to talk about the mesentery, which mesentery means middle. And the parietal peritoneum, when it comes around, it reflects off the posterior abdominal wall as a double membrane, like that. And it transports vessels and nerves. So we look at this other cross section in this schematic, and you see arteries and veins, nerves and lymphatics, and they're coursing in this double membrane from the posterior abdominal wall into the gut tube, into the GI organs. Now, the visceral peritoneum, it lines the intra-abdominal organs in the intraperitoneal space. It's also known as the serosa. So there you have it in green, that surrounding. And so when you take a look at pictures like this often, and you see, oh, mucosa, submucosa, the muscularis externa, and then the serosa, or this of showing the small intestine, and you see all those layers, whenever you see this term serosa, that's synonymous to the visceral peritoneum that we've just been talking about. Now, the peritoneal fluid... That's it there inside the cavity, and its function is to lubricate the surface of organs. And if you don't have enough fluid, then the tissues can adhere to each other and you know, they form adhesions and connections and um, increase friction and cause scarring and adherence of tissues. Now, what is the volume of peritoneal fluid? It's only 50 milliliters, so there's not a lot. So most of this peritoneal space or in the peritoneal cavity is actually... It's really small and there's only a little bit of fluid. So how much is it? Well, there's a can of Coke. That's about it. Diet Coke, that's about it. 50 milliliters or 1.7 fluid ounces of a can of Diet Coke. Now, if you have too much peritoneal fluid, it's called ascites. And so there's normal, about 50 milliliters. And ascites can be as little as 500 milliliters, which is, you know, about a can and a half of Diet Coke to 1500 milliliters. And now we're getting close to, you know, you got almost, you know, a little over four cans of Diet Coke. And at times, people who have really bad ascites, 35 liters. And so to give you an idea of what this looks like, here's an axial CT through the abdomen at the level of the liver. And there is a vertebra, uh, like kind of some happy faces and dark there. You can see the bottom of the lung and there's the liver and then there's the stomach and bright there, there's the rib. And there in those red arrows, that gray, that darker gray is showing this peritoneal fluid just filling that peritoneal space. So it can cause this big swollen abdomen by having that much fluid. Okay, so let's talk about the peritoneal sac. Peritoneal sac is formed by the parietal peritoneum in blue and visceral peritoneum in green. And it's the space between it, or ba basically is the sac is formed by those. And it's filled with peritoneal fluid. Now, here we have in the sagittal section the following. There's our liver, and there's our stomach, and there's the pancreas and the duodenum, and there's the transverse colon, and those other five green circles are the small intestine. And then behind, we have the abdominal aorta, and then we also have at the very bottom, in this infraperitoneal space, we've got the bladder, the uterus, and the rectum. Okay, so the peritoneum is shown there in blue, parietal, visceral, and mesentery in this sagittal section. So there's our parietal peritoneum lining the wall. The mesentery, the double membrane coming off that posterior wall, engulfing organs, and there's a visceral peritoneum that's surrounding, in this case, one loop of small intestine in this picture. Now, there in light blue, filling this cavity, there's the peritoneal sac that contains the peritoneal cavity, which is filled with peritoneal fluid. Now, the peritoneal cavity has two subdivisions. The greater sac, which is primarily the majority of the space of the peritoneal sac, and then behind the stomach and the liver is the lesser sac, behind the lesser omentum. So here we have another cross-section through the liver, and then there's the stomach, and there's the spleen, and there's our portal triad at the free margin of the lesser omentum. So in orange, surrounding the wall, is the parietal peritoneum, and in purple is the visceral peritoneum. And then in blue, there we've got this peritoneal cavity that's filled with peritoneal fluid. Now, the peritoneal cavity has two subdivisions. The greater sac, which is the majority of the peritoneal cavity, but deep to the stomach, we've got this lesser sac right there. And so basically, the greater sac plus the lesser sac equals the peritoneal cavity. And so the lesser sac is really just this space deep to the stomach and lesser omentum and a little bit of the liver. Now, to the, the communication between the greater and lesser sac is through an opening called the epiploic foramen of Winslow. And it's right there 
or in along deep to that free border of the portal triad of the lesser omentum. Uh, we also call that part of the lesser omentum the hepatoduodenal ligament, which I'll talk about more in a few minutes. So the greater omentum is part of this peritoneal sac, uh, a part of the peritoneum, that is this apron-like fold of peritoneum, and it attaches between the stomach and transverse colon primarily, and it has four layers. And so there we have this apron-like peritoneum that drapes over the much of this, the uh, intestines and organs of, this, of the uh, abdominal cavity. And it attaches to the stomach here, and then also to the transverse colon there, and together, it now makes this greater omentum. Now, anatomists, we like to name everything. And so there's really three different parts to the greater omentum. The biggest part is the part that goes between the stomach and transverse colon, hence the name gastro stomach colic colon ligament. Even though it's not a ligament like bone, it just attaches this, mesente uh, this peritoneum that attaches stomach to transverse colon. This picture doesn't show the gastrosplenic ligament and the gastrophrenic ligament, the parts of the greater omentum that goes between the stomach and the spleen and the stomach and the diaphragm. And it has four layers. So basically there's two layers that come from the front and back of the stomach and two layers that come from the front and back or enveloping the transverse colon. So this major part of the greater omentum has four layers. In this picture, what we see is the following. There's the greater omentum in yellow. And so there's our stomach and then it also attaches to our transverse colon that you can see on either side. Now, let's do the following. Let's now outline and remove that part of the greater omentum. And we see these blood vessels that are in there, the gastro-omental arteries and veins. You don't see the veins. We see the arteries of the right and left gastro arteries that supply the greater curvature of the stomach and the greater omentum. And it's also called the gastro-epiploic arteries and veins because this term epiploic or epiplume means to float upon because the greater omentum when the first anatomist first opened up the abdominal cavity we see this big apron floating upon or looking like it's floating upon the intestines and that's why they call the vessels gastroepiploic gastro for stomach epiploic for omentum Okay, so now let's talk about the lesser omentum. And so the lesser omentum is a double layer of peritoneum that attaches between the stomach duodenum and the liver. And so there is this double layer between the stomach and the liver in this sagittal section. And then it attaches between the liver and the stomach. So let's take a look at a different view here. Okay, this anterior view. So there's our liver, and there's the stomach, and there's the duodenum, and just for orientation, there's the spleen. Okay, and so there I've now added, since the picture shows that the lesser omentum dissected open, there's the lesser omentum. Shing! Now the lesser omentum has two components. And so the two parts of the lesser omentum are called the hepatoduodenal and the hepatogastric ligaments. So that dotted line separates. And so the part of the lesser omentum that goes between the liver and the duodenum is called hepatoduodenal ligament. And the part that goes between the liver and the stomach is called the hepatogastric ligament. Now, why do we make a distinction between these two? Well, that hepatoduodenal ligament houses three very important structures that we call it together the portal triad, the hepatic arteries, the bile ducts, and the hepatic portal veins. We call those three things the portal triad, and they're in this, the free margin on the right side of the lesser omentum, and below that, or deep to that, is the epiploic foramen going into the lesser sac. Okay, so now dissolve that out of the way, and we see these blood vessels within the lesser omentum. Those are the gastric arteries and veins going along the lesser curvature. So I think of gastric arteries and veins on the lesser curvature of the stomach, the lesser name for the lesser curvature, and the gastro-omental arteries and veins, the greater name for the greater curvature of the stomach. All right, now describe how the female peritoneal cavity is different from the male. All right, to do that, so... Here, basically, in a nutshell, the female peritoneum has two openings, and the male peritoneum does not. So here in the female, we see the peritoneal sac, and at the bottom of the peritoneal sac are these two openings. Now, in the male, we take a look at the peritoneal sac, there are no openings. And so if we take a sagittal section of that and blow it up, if we look on the lateral pelvic wall, there is one of those openings, okay? One opening on this side because it's sagittal. The other opening would be on the other side. 
And so if we now take this little section and blow it up, this is what it's going to look like. And we have this peritoneum lining the top of the pelvic cavity. And then there is that opening. It's very small. It's less than a millimeter in diameter. And there's a uterine tube ovary and uterus to help give some orientation. And there's our peritoneal cavity. Now in this sagittal section, it's that same space is showing that peritoneal cavity lining. Okay. And so if we now go into here, um, the female peritoneum has an opening on either side, and there it is. Now, the purpose is for the following. When an egg in the ovary, when the egg is ovulated from the ovary, it's going to burst through the peritoneum into the peritoneal cavity, like that. So now the egg is in the peritoneal cavity, and that egg needs to get into the uterine tube to go into the endometrium of the uterus. And so what happens is the egg moves back into the uterine tube via the opening in this female peritoneum. And now it's in the lumen and is able to go to the endometrium of the uterus. Okay. All right. Now, what is the innervation of the peritoneum? So here we have this cross section again, and there's our parietal peritoneum. Now notice the yellow is this intercostal nerve coursing within the wall segmentally all the way from uh, and as well, you know, from thoracic and abdominal uh, cavities. And this intercostal nerve not gives sensation to the overlying skin segmentally, but also is going to segmentally provide sensory innervation to the parietal peritoneum. So parietal peritoneum has somatic sensation via the intercostal nerves. And somatic sensation means pain, temperature, touch, vibration. Key to this is pain, vibration, and um, so if there's inflammation, that's, it's going to be a sharp localized pain. And so let's take a look and see if that represents some type of a painful sensation or any type of sensation. Then that sensation courses along the intercostal nerve and goes to the spinal cord. Um, now, um, there's also some somatic sensation for the diaphragmatic parietal peritoneum that's different because it's more like along the bottom of the diaphragm that part of the parietal peritoneum, it's far away from the abdominal wall, its somatic sensation is via the phrenic nerves. And so there's our diaphragm, and then there's our peritoneal sac, and the phrenic nerves arise from the C3, C4, and C5 spinal cord levels, C3, 4, and 5, keep the diaphragm alive. So they come down, and they provide motor innervation to the diaphragm, but they also pierce through the diaphragm, and as you can see, goes to the diaphragmatic surface and provides sensory innervation of the diaphragmatic portion of the parietal peritoneum in the house that Jack built. Now, the visceral peritoneum gets its visceral sensation, a lot of these stretch receptors and such, by visceral sensory neurons. Since these are visceral sensory, there is no pain receptors or somatic sensation in these traveling in these neurons. And so visceral afferent neurons, they course along blood vessels within the double layered mesentery, and then they course all the way back um, and follow visceral afferents back to the uh, appropriate spinal cord levels or brainstem levels. What about, okay, let's talk about the peritoneum and its vascular supply. So where's the aorta in relation to the peritoneum? The answer, in the retroperitoneal space. Now, the two-layered mesentery transports arteries and veins and lymphatics and autonomics from the retroperitoneal space into the double-layered mesentery and then to supply the visceral peritoneum as well as the organs contained therein. Now, define the terms retroperitoneal and intraperitoneal and list the organs that fall under each of these categories. Okay, so where is this retroperitoneal space and what is it? Well, this word prefix retro means behind and peritoneal means the peritoneum. So we look over here and we go, okay, there's the peritoneum outlined in blue and in yellow, that's the retroperitoneal space, which is behind the peritoneum. And within that retroperitoneal space are retroperitoneal organs. And so... Organs are considered retroperitoneal if they have peritoneum on their anterior side only, shing, on the anterior side only, are not suspended by mesentery, there's the mesentery, no mesentery, and lie between the parietal peritoneum and abdominal wall, parietal peritoneum and abdominal wall. So if it lists, if, if, an, if all of these three conditions are met, then an organ is considered retroperitoneal. Um, what organs does the retroperitoneal space contain? Sad pucker. 
that's what it contains. And so what is that? Well, SAD pucker is an acronym for S, suprarenal glands, A, aorta and IVC, D, the duodenum, second, third, and fourth parts, then P for the pancreas, the head, neck, and body, U for the ureters, C for colon, specifically ascending and descending, K for kidneys, E for esophagus, and R for rectum, Darnell killed them. Now, I do want to make a mention here that most surgeons do not consider the ascending and descending colon as um, retroperitoneal. Surgeons, most of them consider these as intraperitoneal because they the way they move and uh, within the abdominal cavity is more like an intraperitoneal organ. So even though in embryology and most anatomy texts, we talk about how the ascending and descending colon are retroperitoneal, in reality, they don't function that way. All right. Now, what is an intraperitoneal organ? Well, the word intra means inside and peritoneal means peritoneum. So we take a look at the peritoneal cavity and shing, there's an organ inside the peritoneal cavity. And organs are considered intraperitoneal if they reside within the peritoneal cavity, check, and are suspended by mesentery, check. So those are the two factors that consider if an organ is intraperitoneal or not. Now, what organs does intraperitoneal, does the intraperitoneal space contain? The answer to that is salty spurs or salted, pardon me, salted spurs. Now, what does the acronym salted spurs mean? Well, S is for stomach, A is for the appendix, L is for liver, T is for transverse colon, and D is for duodenum. The key to this is it's only the first part of the duodenum, that duodenal bulb or duodenal cap, the part that's um, right after the pylorus. And then the S stands for small intestines, specifically jejunum and ileum. The P is for pancreas, but only the tail, the tip of the tail that touches the spleen, um, the rectum, but only the upper third, the spleen, as just mentioned, and the sigmoid colon. So that acronym of salted spurs is the acronym to tell you what organs are considered intraperitoneal. All right. So now may I please make a small detour with regards to intraperitoneal organs? Um, so here we have uh, that cross section again of the abdomen in blue, the peritoneum. Now let's take a section as if you're dissecting or during surgery and you open up the abdominal cavity. So now you're looking inside and you see that organ and you see the fluid in the peritoneal cavity. Now, remember this fist in the balloon analogy? Well, there's the fist and there's the air in the balloon. The fist is not inside the balloon. The fist simply pushed in the side of the balloon and is covered in plastic. The intraperitoneal organs are not inside the peritoneal cavity. The organ simply pushed in the side of the peritoneal sac and is now covered in visceral peritoneum. So here's an intraperitoneal organ. There's a retroperitoneal organ. If you follow the fascia within, they're actually in the same fascial planes. When you see an intraperitoneal organ, even when you open up the abdomen, it's not in the cavity, even though we call it an intraperitoneal organ. It's all contained within this sac, okay? All right, now let's talk about the peritoneum in a nutshell. All right, so there's parietal peritoneum that lines the wall, the mesentery, a double membrane that goes to the visceral peritoneum, and there we have all three. And the uh, behind the parietal peritoneum are retroperitoneal organs, and we remember that as sad pucker. And then the, within the visceral peritoneum, we have intraperitoneal organs. And remember all those organs as salted spurs. And that, my friends, is the peritoneum in a nutshell.